All right, we are a couple minutes past, so we'll get started now. My name is Nadia Kenna. I'm a research associate at the UK Data Service based at uh, UOM. And this is the workshop named Mapping Crime Data in R, an introduction to GIS and spatial data. Before um, starting with the content, I'm just going to run through some um, introductions, but just to kind of let you know that this presentation will be treated as an introduction to the main topics and issues involved with GIS and mapping data. Um, now, it isn't going to provide a huge array of information, but it will detail what is necessary in order to understand the code demonstration on Wednesday. So I'm going to turn off my video and start with uh, the slides. So today, here is the content. Uh, we're going to discuss exactly what GIS is. We then move on to look at spatial data versus non-spatial data. Uh, we then talk about the different types of maps that are available, both reference and thematic. And then we move on to a bit more of a complicated topic known as the projection methods and coordinate reference systems. Lastly, we kind of draw on to a bit of a conversation about the challenges of mapping crime data. In the second part of this workshop, which is being held on March 8th, on Wednesday, we will be doing our live code demonstration in our studio. And these are some of the topics that we will be covering. We start with really like an explanatory um, of our crime data set, looking at how to turn ordinary crime data into spatial data. We then talk about shape files and we move on to combining census data in order to calculate crime rate instead of just the crime count. And there's also some fun interactive um, and fun extra topics such as how to make interactive maps. There's a little bit on jittering, and there's also some information about how to use Google API to map data. But yeah, let's get started with the workshop, enough of the introductions. So what exactly is GIS? GIS stands for Graphical Information System. It can be defined as a computer system for capturing, storing, checking, and displaying data related to positions on Earth's surface. It can kind of be seen as like a theoretical framework that allows for the creation and analysis of spatial and geographical data. I like to view this as a bit of an abstract platform that tends to integrate data onto a map using various methods. Now, GIS is present in almost every field and every organization as it's a way to share information and to solve complex problems around the world. The biggest benefit, I would say, is allowing for trends and patterns to be studied visually, which provides a new form of analysis. I'm going to give you a quick history about GIS, but nothing too boring. But it was kind of established in uh, the 1960s by a pioneer named Roger Tomlinson, and he was commissioned by the Canadian government to create a usable and efficient inventory of its natural resources. Now, he tried various manual methods for overlaying environmental, economic and cultural variables onto a map, but he found that these were all too costly or too timely. So he helped to create the first automated computing system, and he was known as the father of GIS. And from there, we've had loads of re researchers develop this, such as Laura and uh, Jack Dangamond, who developed the Environmental System Research Institute, also known as the ESRI or ESRI, which is um, a really common software developed for mapping and spatial analysis. Geographical information systems, um, it, all data in geographical information systems are georeferenced, meaning it has both attribute and a location. An attribute kind of consists of what it is, and a location is, you know, where it is. And this has to be a known location. An example of a known location could be the latitude and longitude. You could have national grid coordinates, or you might have things that um, a bit more of an implicit reference. So things like an address, a postal code, a forest stand identifier, road names, census tract names, those things. Um, and an automated process called geocoding is then used to create this explicit, explicit geographic references from implicit references. And these geographic references allow you to locate features such as businesses or forest stands or even events on the Earth's surface for analysis. Um, in relation to crime data, the attributes that you might see in crime data could consist of um, where the call was received, who received the call, or the type of crime that we have. Now, there are various softwares available for running GIS. I tend to use RStudio, and I've dabbled in ArcGIS a little bit. Um, but as you know, this workshop will be using... Oh, this workshop will be using our studios on Wednesday's demonstration. And this is because I believe that there is 
an increasing amount of packages have become available for spatial analysis and mapping in the last couple of years. And it's also a really great tool for visualization. And kind of just out of interest, maybe just me being a bit nosy, I'm interested in to know what software you use the most. If you want to head back over to Mentimeter and you can just pop in your vote there, what software slash have you slash do you use? I figure that a lot of people will be selecting R Studios since, you know, hence it's the name of the talk. Um, if you do end up selecting other, I'd be really interested to know what software this is. Um, if you could just leave a comment in the in the Zoom chat, that'd be great. And I'd have a look at this when we're on a little break. This is partly me just being nosy, but also um, it's kind of nice to get a general consensus. Definitely got the majority sitting on our studio, which is no surprise. We we'll just give that another twenty seconds or so to let to let votes keep rolling through. So votes have kind of come to us still, so we'll move on from that. Thank you again for participating. So, how exactly is GIS used? Esri or the ESRI, however you prefer to say it, um, they summarise six key uses that I found really interesting. This is to identify problems, monitor change, manage and respond to events perform forecasting, set priorities, and to understand trends. And I think this provides a really useful um, kind of set of uses, especially related to crime data. So one example that I want to talk about uh, related to identifying problems, but kind of addresses them all, was an example on the uh, Esri website. And they showed how GIS addresses the inequality of urban renewal. And this introduces us to the term redlined maps. In, um, in 1936, there was a company called the HOLC, which was a home owner's loan company, and they hired real estate accessors to create color-coded security maps. These maps use a rating system to assign grades to neighborhoods reflecting their residential security. Basically, it shows which neighborhoods are more risky and therefore less likely for banks to um, loan from. Now, back then, you can kind of imagine who was making these, these maps, you know, probably older white males, maybe more established, maybe um, higher class. But the colours in this map represent different classes. So the green represented upper class, blue represented white collar class, uh, you had yellow, which was the working class, and then you have that red, which is uh, the lower class. Now, funny enough, these red areas were actually marked as hazardous, as they were home to foreign born people, uh, black people, lower class people. And this is where the term redlining comes from. So what, the, what happened was uh, lenders used these maps to determine which neighbourhoods would be safest for financial investment. But these assumptions were based solely on neighbourhood descriptions, not information about individual borrowers. But with the advancement of GIS analysis and new data sets, they were able to uncover relationships between these redlined areas and environmental conditions, which included things like temperature and tree coverage and topography. And there was a study conducted at the University of Richmond, where they performed a text analysis on the keywords in these forms that made up the map. And they were able to make the connection between environmental terms and their relationship to favourable or less favourable grade designations. So like thanks to new advancements in high resolution data sets, we can thoroughly examine the environmental legacy of these redlined neighborhoods. And it helped to kind of expose the social effects and the physical environment. <clears throat> so here are just some of the questions that GIS allows us to explore with crime data. You might be interested in where are the most vulnerable communities located? For example, if individuals want to use crime maps to safeguard their personal safety, then, you know, avoiding areas with a high level of, let's say, street robberies, and clearly a geographical representation of crime would be appropriate here. What about if you were interested in why crimes occur in one area and not the other? If you come from a criminological or sociological background, you know that there are a lot of crime theories that have ex helped to explain this. One theory is known as the crime pattern theory, and it integrates crime within a geographical context that demonstrates how the environment people live in and pass through influence criminality. So, for example, you know, a suburban neighbourhood can become a hotspot for bur burglaries because some homes have inadequate protection and nobody home to guard that property. And you might want to 
visualise that distribution across certain areas. What about how do offenders travel to the crime location? In other words, what is it about one specific place that convinces an offender to commit? Again, there's been loads of reasons that kind of affect how far and oh, how far an offender travels. Um, in fact, there was a bit of research done by, I believe, Ackerman in 2015 that he found that violent crimes had a shorter medium distance to crimes than property crimes. And then they were then able to visualise this trend on a map. Or what about where are, where are there more or less stop and searches than we would expect in relation to the distribution of crime? So in this question, you'd be comparing the actual distribution of crime and the level of stop and search um, in one area, you can then start to question, you know, the necessity of stop and search. You can start to ask questions about whether it's a tool for crime reduction or crime detection, or, you know, you can just start to question these police powers and have them visualised on a map. <clears throat> so let's, uh, let's move on. GIS are known to produce two broad types of maps. These are known as reference and theomatic maps. Reference maps are used to communicate location on more static data points. They are used to pinpoint data on a map. So this can be viewed as the as a description, as very like descriptive analysis. We then have a thematic map, and this is used to highlight a spatial relationship. This is to study a theme within a map, and this is where it becomes a little bit more explanatory. <clears throat> um, here is an example of what a reference and a thematic map might look like. On the left, you see that a reference map, they tend to just highlight natural patterns or synthetic features, including the positioning and heights of mountains or the layout of bus routes. And yeah, this type of map is simply referencing, hence the name, what exists in our physical environment. On the other hand, these thematic maps highlight a spatial relationship. It's how we map a particular theme to a geographic area. It tells us a story about a place and is commonly used to map subjects like population densities, health issues, um, climate issues, or even just distribution. So sometimes the difference between reference and theomatic maps can become confusing. So let's have a look at an example. In this example, we have a tube map. There was a, a project called Lives on the Line. They, they discuss that most government statistics are mapped according to official geographical units, such as wards or lower layer super output areas. And now, whilst these units are essential for data analysis, a lot of people are unfamiliar with what wards or lower layer super output areas actually are. They're a bit uncommon to, you know, people who aren't in academia or research or statisticians. <clears throat> So they decided to try a new method that used tube stops as their geographic unit, as their unit of analysis. And they aimed to show life expectancy statistics across different tube stations in London. Now, looking at this map, could you say that this is a reference or a theomatic map? You know, let's have a, let's have a little uh, look. In one instance, you might say that this is a reference map because... They show the location of different tube stations and the location of each line. You know, they're highlighting a synthetic feature on a map. However, you might also view this to be a thematic map because you are mapping a particular theme to a geographic area. In this case, they're predicting life expectancy and other factors like poverty and medium house prices to certain tube stations. They're showing a spatial uh, relationship between a social factor and a physical feature. Um, if you're interested, the link to Lives on the Line is found here. It's also in the references and we'll send this out, I guess, at the end of the talk. But this is a little interactive map that kind of helps you explore the differences and shows you how, just how a spatial relationship can be mapped out. But to get you guys thinking a little bit about it yourself, I've come up with a few scenarios and if you want to head back over to Mentimeter, you can participate in this part of the quiz. So I want you to have a think and decide whether you think that this scenario fits the description of a reference map or a theomatic map. So the visualisation of road networks to improve road safety measures are a type of what map? I'll give this a couple minutes or a couple seconds. 
and then we'll uh, discuss the answer. Well done to whoever voted no idea. We like honesty in this workshop. And that's absolutely okay if you have no idea. I can understand that the, the two can be pretty confusing. It seems that the majority have stated that it could be both. And I think I might just agree with you here because if you break this scenario down into two aspects, right? At first, this might be said to be a type of reference map as we are simply pinpointing existing road networks onto a map, right? So we have a map that shows all the different road networks. However, this might also be said to be a type of thematic map as we're studying the existing road networks to then improve safety measure, measures, which can be um, seen as a type of like accident analysis. <clears throat> so yeah, we're studying spatially the relationship between road networks and accidents. And this might then lead to, you know, the introduction of speed signs or zebra crossings or increased street light lighting in certain places. But the point is they are mapping a particular theme to a geographic area. We'll move on to scenario two. The visualization of the Earth's surface showing its elevation can be considered what type of map? Everyone's voting reference. We've got another no idea. We like the honesty and we've got a good, could be both. We've still got a few votes coming in, so we'll just let this roll out for another 15 seconds. All right, the votes are slowing down, so I think I'll discuss what I think the answer is. I would have said that this, yeah, this is a reference map because um, the visualization of the Earth's surface showing its elevation is actually a type of uh, topographic map. And these maps refer to a graphical representation of the three dimensional configuration of the surface of the Earth. So, in short, it's simply describing or showing where the Earth's surface, surface is elevated. These maps are normally represented by contour lines. So you might have seen these on a map before, but you know, the closer the lines, the um, less height there is, right? And that's kind of just a description is pinpointing. But for those that voted could be, could be both, you are onto something because you might also view this type of map as a thematic map. Research has suggested that studying a topographic map is a great way to learn how to match terrain features with the contour lines on the map. So this include this could include the steepness of the terrain, the shape of the terrain, or whether it's above or below sea level. So in this instance, you might interpret that we are studying spatially the relationship of contour lines to the different features of the earth. But at the same time, it is kind of the way you use the map, right? So if you answered any of the options, consider yourself to be correct. <laughs> well done. Either way, the answer is open to debate. It's the difference between mapping places and mapping data. We'll move to scenario three. So creating a map that shows the location of different species of birds in a particular area is an example of, again, reference, thematic. Um, no idea, could be both. Got the majority voting for thematic this time, interesting. And we've got a few could be both. Maybe people are catching on with what I'm doing here. <laughs> we've got a couple of references as well, but we've got no ideas. I mean, we've got no, no ideas, so that's good. I'll give it another 10 seconds. There's a few more votes still rolling through. Sweet, it looks like we are paused. Um, so yeah, I think if you had voted thematic, I would probably agree with you in this instance because this type of map is used to show the spatial distribution of the different bird species, right? It's not just indicating um, where particular birds are, but it's telling us the distance between different birds. And that is indicating more than just a description. It's telling us more than just 
about the physical land. So again, all answers here are right. It can be considered reference. It can be considered thematic. So congratulations to all. <laughs> and I think we've just got one more scenario and then we'll get to uh, move on. So in this last scenario, navigation tools, things like Google Maps, City, Map City Mapper or, or Waze or whatever, do you think that these are classed as a reference map or a theomatic map? The majority of votes are sitting on a reference map. We've got one vote for theomatic. And again, we've got more people saying this could be both, which means you'll probably catch on with what I'm trying to tell you here. Got about 23 votes in, so I'll just give that another 10 seconds. Votes are still shifting, but it definitely shows that the majority are sitting on a reference. So again, I, I would have agreed, like immediately, you might assume that this is an obvious type of reference map, right? As it's highlighting um, important physical features such as bus routes, walking routes, cycle lanes, which are all needed for travel. So it is just telling us where certain routes exist on a map, which is very much descriptive. However, <laughs> surprise, surprise, this might also be said to, to be a thematic map, right? Because reference maps portray a basic set of features, as we've said, like coastlines, terrains, transport routes. But can we say that an app that plans your travel is a type of reference map? Because if it uses some sort of AI algorithm to get you to one place to another, you know, normally choosing you the fastest route or the cheapest route, can we call this a thematic map instead, since it's overlaying additional information onto our reference map? And this is a really interesting debate, actually, and it kind of draws back to the father of JS, Roger Tomlinson. He draws importance to analog versus digital maps and their place that they can have in GIS. And recently, researchers have considered navigational tools to be fundamentally different from both reference and theoretic maps, which kind of opens debate for a third category. Don't know what that third category is, but there is um, some sort of like ambiguity around where navigational tools stand. So it could be argued that all maps are navigational, right? Just depending on how you use them. The difference is that a digital map, one that is specifically interactive, like Google Maps, <clears throat> and um, yeah, and this is exactly what Roger did, Roger Tomlinson did. He couldn't overlay, overlay his data on an analog map. So, you know, he moved towards computation. So yeah, navigational tools doesn't have a correct answer yet. There isn't a, it doesn't 100% belong as a thematic, nor does it 100% belong as a reference because it does tell us more than descriptions. It tells us how to do something, even though this isn't necessarily a spatial relationship. So what can we sum up about reference and thematic maps? As we said, they fall into two broad categories, but there are ways in which these types of maps overlap or share similarities. I would say that almost every thematic map is also a reference map, but not every reference map is a thematic map. <clears throat> the decision is, is up to you. You know, it's not entirely necessary to define these in your work, but it is important to know what type of map you want to make, as these can be affected by the data you have. And just to give you guys, to, to keep you guys keep thinking, I've got one more question on Mentimeter. And yeah, I want you to try and give me an example of any other types of map that you think shares properties of both reference and thematic descriptions. Uh, you could type in your answer and they'll come up on the screen. 
and then we can have a little dis discussion about any answers that appear. So I'll give this 20 odd seconds, maybe a bit longer. That's great. We have loads of answers coming through at the moment. Heat maps, definitely. Heat maps are typically known as theoretic maps. But, you know, if this heat map has some basic information about the physical slash synthetic features of the land, then obviously this will include, you know, or fit in the description of a reference map. Um, we have hotspot maps, definitely. This is a... Hotspot maps are a, almost a key in, in crime mapping. It's a way to aggregate or discuss the like highest levels of crime in certain areas. And again, this definitely shows properties of both because we sh under, we're showing the underlying spatial distribution and then, you know, providing references. So where this has happened. Uh, we've got Kriging maps, which I believe uh, would definitely be properties of both as well. I think this is where they used a uh, sample data point to estimate uh, the value of a variable over a continuous spatial field. So yeah, that would definitely be considered both. We've got world maps, definitely would be considered both. If they are color coded by population size, definitely, because this is highlighting some sort of distrib distribution. Uh, we've got income maps would definitely be the same. Um, my screen is glitching a little bit, so I'm struggling to see new answers that are appearing, but we're getting there. Map showing what areas are farmlands, forests, etc. Uh, yeah, that I guess could be seen as a thematic. I guess the point being is how you then use those maps, because if this is a map that just shows descriptions about farmlands and forests, rather than, let's say, um, the nearest distance from each of these farmlands, then this might be seen as more of a reference map. We've got income maps and social status. Definitely, this is a way to kind of map um, variations in, in population. Uh, we've got weather maps. Yes, weather maps are really interesting, actually. And we discuss weather maps a little bit later on. Um, weather maps, yes, I would say are thematic because they provide data on more of a continuous level and show you, um, you know, the spatial distribution of different climate changes in a map. So, and yeah, I think... My screen is glitching, so I'm struggling to see any new answers that are appearing, but I think I might have uh, addressed all of them. And on that note, I think we're going to have a quick five minute break while I fill up my water bottle and I'll come back to answer any questions in the Q&A and then we'll continue on with the rest of the slide. Hey all, um, I am back. Sorry about that. Um, I've also just seen a question in the Q&A, which I will read out loud. And it asks, is there ever an instance where a map could be thematic, but not reference? It seems to me that a map by construction will need to have references. And yes, you'd be right. That was kind of the, the what I wanted to demonstrate in, in the scenarios is that most reference maps, sorry, most thematic maps will have some sort of reference, right? Because how else are we to understand the map? Imagine a map without any indications of what area we're in or what size um, or what like what unit of analysis we're working in. Or imagine there are no street names or no city names, then we're reading a map that doesn't tell us anything about anything. But uh, yeah, thanks all for participating in that. We've got loads of great answers in there, loads of great examples. But we'll move on to the next part of the webinar now. So we're going to move on to discussing what exactly uh, spatial data is. Spatial data or geospatial data is a data frame that contains information about a specific location, which can then be analyzed to better understand that location. I like to see it as a representation of the real world. It attempts to represent the physical features of the data 
in a accurate way. Now, GIS then enables the spatial data to be processed and analyzed. They kind of work hand in hand. With, without one, you wouldn't be able to complete the other. There are two types of spatial data. That is the vector data and raster data. These are two very different but common data formats that are used to store geospatial data. So let's have a look at the differences between the two. The break, there's no break, that was the wrong slide. <laughs> vector data. Now vector data is the most common form and it consists of points, lines and polygons. Points are a pair of coordinates. This is the exact location of where something happened. So in relation to crime data, this might be the location of where a robbery was reported. We then have lines, and lines extend the points and include at least two. Now this could be, for example, the street that that robbery was received on. We then have polygons, and polygons extend the lines and include three or more points. So this could be the area, the city, or the ward that that, that robbery um, on that street belongs in. You can kind of hear this like you're zooming out from a map. So you start really zoomed in. You could be just looking at, for example, you know, your house. Imagine you're looking at your house on a map. That would be the point. You then zoom out a bit and you'd be looking at where your house belongs on that street. And you zoom out a little bit more and you'll see that your house belongs in this city or this area. <clears throat> you then have what is known as raster data. And this is imagery or satellite data that are formed from a grid of pixels. Now, this type of data has been described, quote unquote, as a dumb electronic map image that is made up of a number of set of pixels. The issue with raster data is that you cannot manipulate the information. So you can't move a place name around. And when you zoom into the map, it can you know, become quite pixelated and unreadable, just like a photo taken on uh, like a digital camera or like this image that you see on the screen. Uh, but on the contrary, raster data are well suited for representing data that changes continuously across a landscape or a surface. Um, Yeah, they provide a really good method of storing the continuity as a surface. Uh, an example of this type of continuous data would be things like temperature or elevation or the weather map that was discussed earlier. And each pixel will represent a different value or a different attribute within the overall range of values for that data. Now it's Pretty uncommon to work with raster data uh, early on in like introductory lessons. So when we move on to our code demonstration on Wednesday, we're mainly going to be working with vector data. Um, and that's because we're not working with, you know, continuous data across, you know, surfaces. So now we have a basic understanding of spatial data. This is where we ask, how do we actually pinpoint a location to a map? And we do this through projection methods. Map projections try to portray the surface of the earth or a portion of the earth on a flat piece of paper. Map projections try to transform the earth from its spherical shape, that is the 3D, to a planar shape, that is the 2D. And that is how we actually pinpoint a location to a map. And I hope my image, <laughs> My amazing image has been able to visualize that a bit for you, but it's just about moving from the 3D to the 2D. And I have a bit, I have a bit of a better example for you here. Imagine you have a football and you begin cutting it up with a knife. Now, if you were to put this football back together into a sphere, you would be all right. There probably wouldn't be any issues. It'd be a little bit bumpy, but it would still fit back into a perfect sphere. However, if you tried to recreate this 
into a rectangle or a square or a triangle, it just wouldn't fit together perfectly. So these projections are simply equations that tell a mapping system, the GIS, how to populate a new area or new shape. So if we wanted to create a rectangle, we might have something like this, where all the area is populated. And this is what mapping systems do. They reshape, they flatten, and then they make it uh, manageable for us to then make maps on a 2D surface. Now, you might already be thinking that surely there's going to be issues with this. How can we make something 3D, 2D? That's never going to be perfect, as we've discussed. And you would be right, because it's important to note that during this uh, transformation, during the projection methods, the data can become distorted, which leads to the misrepresentation of area, shape, distance, and direction. So although there are uh, algorithms in place to control for this, all four features are rarely preserved. And I like to give this example um, where imagine you have a map projection as an attempt to reconstruct your face in two dimensions. So some maps will get the shapes of all your features just right, but maybe not the sizes. Maybe your forehead or your chin or your nose came out bigger or smaller. You know, other maps will get the sizes right, but the shapes will be stretched. So maybe your mouth has become wider than usual. And, you know, some maps then try to preserve the distance, but maybe the distance from your lip to your nose is shorter than what you're used to. And so on, so on. So, yeah, you just have to think that squashing something from the 3D to the 2D is obviously going to affect um, these four um, factors, call it that. And, uh, yeah, so... It, Kind of all depends on which attributes you are willing to compromise. Some try to maintain the correct distance, others the correct shape, others the correct area. But typically you aim to find a sort of sweet spot in the middle that balances all these factors. And this is why you see projections that are individual to different countries. Um, so different regions and different districts and even different in countries have different projections that might distort or make a map look a little bit different than what you're used to. So there are actually three projection families. This is known as the cylindrical, the conical and the planar. And I'm not going to talk too much about them, but as you can see by the image, this is the way of um, making your projections. And within each projection family, there are hundreds to thousands of different types of projection. And they're not necessarily, they're not necessary to know, but I do have an example that um, shows how maps can become distorted due to different projection methods. So I'm gonna be using the example of the world map on two different projections just to kind of demonstrate to you what happens in terms of this distortion. <clears throat> so let's have a look at these projections. Right, we have two maps here. On the left, we have a map that was made with the Web Mercator projection. And on the right, we have a map that was made with the Gal Peter projection. Now, the Mercator uses something called, um, I believe, angular conformity. And this is a type of projection from the conical family. And on the right, we have the Galpeters, which is a projection from the cylindrical family. Now the Peters projection is unique among world maps because the area ratios of all these continents are the same as they are in reality. And that is Greenland, for example, doesn't seem larger than Africa. Whereas if you compare this to the Mercator, you can see that Greenland is as large, if not larger than Africa. Um, the Mercator projection 
tends to distort the size of continents. And this causes what you might know as the Greenland is larger than Africa effect. But the Mercator is able to stay true to their shape. So geographically speaking, the shapes are more imp important because it's far easier to change the scale of a map for different areas of the world than to adjust the length width ratio as you need to do with the Peters. Additionally, um, the Mercator tends to distort the longitudinal distances, whereas the Peters tends to like mess up the scale almost everywhere for both longitude and latitude. And this is why the Mercator beats out the Peters in the world of like maps and cartography. And Google Maps itself uses a modified Mercator projection. And this is typically what we see in, as, as the world map. This is what we are used to. Even though like the Mercators is, in, is almost enlarging northern areas than they actually are. So yes, both projections have their strengths, have their weaknesses, but the choice of projection will typically depend on the specific needs of the analysis or the application. So in general, it's important to be aware of the potential for distortion in any map projection and to choose the projection that best meets the needs of the intended um, analysis and audience. Because yeah, obviously looking at these both, looking at these maps both, they portray very different perceptions of different countries. So I hope that example's been able to show you the effects of projection and how distortion um, can be seen on a map. Uh, we're gonna just take another couple minute break here because I do like to break up my talks a little bit. I hope that's okay. Uh, we'll come back in, I'll be back in approximately two to three minutes, just stretching my legs and I'll be right back. All right, I am back. I've stretched my legs, feeling a bit better. So we're gonna continue on with the rest of this webinar. Um, so yeah, we've discussed our projection methods. Um, the real question now is, so we know how to move from the 3D to the 2D by our projection methods, but um, how do we actually move from the 3D to the, C to the 2D? How do these projection methods actually work? And the move from the 3D to the 2D is done with the help of CRS, also known as a coordinate reference system. Now, every place on Earth is specified by three numbers, our coordinates. This is the latitude, the longitude, and the altitude. And each number indicates the distance between some point and your fixed reference, also known as the origin. So once you have your coordinate reference system, you can match this with a projection system that will enable you to move from the 3D to the 2D. So let's have a look, look at the um, two types of reference system that exist. We have geographic coordinate systems and we have projected coordinate systems. Now, a geographic system is it, it defines where the data is located on the Earth's surface. So it defines the data um, across the spherical globe, across um, that it defines the location of features on a model that is Earth, that is the globe, that's that spherical shape we were talking about. And as you can see in the image, um, we're represented by the angular units. So this is the degrees, and this is how you know that we're sat in the 3D. We then have the projected system, and the projected system tells the data then how to draw this onto a flat surface, like a paper or you know, a computer screen. And the projected system, stay with me here, it contains a geographic system, but it converts this geographic system into a flat surface using the projection algorithms from the previous slides. And in this instance, you can see that in the projected system, with those numbers at the bottom, they are represented uh, by meters. And this is because this is a 
linear unit, and this is because we are now on a flat surface. So let's have a quick look at an example of a coordinate reference system that we might see uh, online working with certain systems. <clears throat> so as we said, the projected system tells you how to draw this onto a flat surface. And in this example, at the top, you can see that we are using the fuller projection system, which I'm not entirely sure what the fuller is, but the point is that it's using a projection system um, named fuller. It's also associated by a WKID, which is just under the word projection. The WKID is, or stands for, the well-known identifier. And this is just a reference number that links up to a certain projection system. When we scroll down, when we look at the bottom, you see that we also have a geographic coordinate system. And this time, the, the geographic coordinate system, remember, tell you where on earth the data uh, should draw. In this instance, we're using the WGS 1984. Uh, this is the World Geodetic System, and it's probably one of the most common forms of geographic coordinate systems that you will use. Uh, at the same time, we also have a WKID, that is just that reference number. And we'll see in our code demonstration on Wednesday that we're going to actually be exploring this geographic coordinate system using our reference number. Typically, you only need to enter the, the authority and the WKID, that, and that will call on the correct system. Um, so I guess a few things to remember. Geographic coordinate systems fail to measure the distance, and that's why the projected systems um, become meaningful because this information is needed on a flat screen, which can be done via various projection methods, you know? So when working with more than one form of spatial data, it's important to ensure that the data is stored in the same coordinate reference system, or they will fail to line up with the GIS the graphical information system. And the decision of which map projection and coordinate reference system to use depends on the regional extent of the area you want to work in, um, the, possibly the type of analysis you want to do, but most importantly is the availability of the data. So that kind of gives a brief introductory summary to our projection systems and our coordinate systems but once we explore this in R, you see how much how easier this is to understand once working with some practice data. So once you've got all of this kind of, um, so once you understand what type of data you have, whether that be vector or raster, once you understand what a what coordinate system you need to work in, you would then typically move on to your next stages in your in your research project in your analysis. And this would typically involve the spatial analysis. So to put into words that might be a bit more familiar, spatial analysis is kind of like the method section of your paper. This is where the bulk of the analysis would be. And I've listed six what I think are very popular methods in crime. Um, but in short, spatial analysis refers to studying entities by examining, uh, evaluating, and then modeling spatial data features, such as the location, the attributes, and the relationships that reveal data's geometric or geographic properties. Uh, we've already discussed some maps that involve some spatial analysis when we were looking at the differences between reference and theoretic. So we have a very brief understanding. Um, I would say that spatial analysis is incredibly important for crime mapping because it can reveal patterns that may not be immediately apparent in the data. Um, for example, spatial autocorrelation is a technique that measures the degree to which crime occurs near each other in space. So you can start to look at like neighboring relationships. Kernel density estimation is also a really common spatial analysis technique in crime mapping. And this is a technique that creates a density map 
showing where crimes are most concentrated. And this is um, similar, but key differences with um, hotspot analysis, which we also spoke about today. But yeah, hotspot analysis is just a technique that identifies areas with high crime rates, right? And all of these types of analysis then go on to allow law enforcement agencies and practitioners, practitioners and policymakers to target these areas with more resources and more help. So we're drawing on to our last topic of the talk, which um, what are the main challenges of mapping crime data? I've listed a few on the slide and I'll talk through these and we'll give you the chance to kind of think about any others. But uh, most crime data or the most common way to get crime data is from the police. It's from police.co.uk um, website. But using open police data can be criticised, you know. Firstly, police recorded crime provides point information through the use of GIS. So that's that point uh, data that we discussed as part of the vector data. But the accuracy of this point data tends to be obscured by geo-masking techniques, um, also known as geo-privacy. And this is just a way to protect the exact location of where a crime was reported in order to um, protect the location privacy of victims, which obviously makes sense because providing the exact location of where a crime was reported obviously can be risky for both victim and offender. And uh, I believe the technique used to do this is called jittering, which um, we do talk a little bit about in the code demo. So what you think might have you know, happened outside a school might not have actually happened in that exact location. Secondly, uh, police recorded crime are a known contribution to the gray figure in that they underestimate the actual number of crimes recorded and not just reported, which uh, reduces the accuracy of statistical models due to missing data. Um, and yeah, this isn't something that can be overcome in, in mapping techniques, but there are ways to minimize this, like um, the reliability of missing data. And, you know, there are also some conceptual issues surrounding its definition of certain crime types. For example, in police recorded crime statistics, they tend to combine violent crimes and sexual offences into one category. Now, this should be viewed with caution when, you know, doing your analysis, because it tends to apply quite an overtly holistic definition by conceptualising, you know, two pretty indifferent crimes, but into one category. So what effect is that going to have on your results? Especially if you were just interested in one or the other. And the last kind of challenge that I'd like to address is just the impacts of seasonality. For example, how has COVID-19 affected police recorded crime statistics? You know, over the pandemic, uh, government put in restrictions. They we were forced to go into lockdown and there was new rules, right? <clears throat> and due to this increased government restriction, there was reductions in certain types of crime. For example, there was a reduction in burglary as more people were forced to work from home, therefore reducing the opportunity for these crimes to happen. So yeah, it's not entirely accurate to hold year-to-year -year comparisons because comparing trends from 2021 are going to be innately different to trends in 2018. Uh, so yeah, these are just a few of the main challenges, but I realise I've been speaking for a little while, so I'm going to give you the opportunity to see if you can think of any more. Um, head back to Mentimeter if you'd like, and uh, yeah, share your opinion on what you think the main challenges of mapping crime data might be. Um, we'll come back to this in a minute or so. So we've got a few responses uh, coming through. We have no data, which I assume means that um, there is just some data that is not provided. Is that kind of linked back to the figure of crime and that 
you know, there is a the actual number of crimes recorded and the number reported are very different. So we're missing a whole lot of information there. Um, another point that kind of links to this whole no data thing is um, the way certain demographics of the population feel affected by having to call the police. In fact, there was a study by Graeber and Stern, which I think I've also left in the references, and then they highlight, highlighted that to call the police is a privilege of, of being white. And, you know, police legitimacy can also affect the willingness to call the police. This also means, this also kind of leads on to the fact that a lot of crime data doesn't include demographic variables. So we don't really know much about age or gender or race or religion or anything. These crime data statistics provided by the police tend to just tell you about that crime type and where it was recorded. There are obviously solutions to go about this by combining police data with other data sets like the census, which we also do in the code demonstration. But yeah, something to think about. Um, dealing with sensitive data, that's very true. I guess this is kind of like back to the whole conversation of qualitative versus quantitative methods, because the use of quantitative methods can be seen as pretty you know insensitive whereas uh running qualitative analysis on let's say the crime survey for england and wales that tends to provide a much more individualistic experience of crime whereas these quantitative studies and quantitative analysis definitely has a larger application of um generalizing results um, just checking the time looks like we're doing well the political situation can impact the way of creating crime maps and some areas might not figure out the right number of crime data. Yeah, you would absolutely be right. Um, you know, different areas, um, it could be easier or harder to report these crimes. A lot of these crimes, you know, then go unreported as it is or unrecorded. So there is a lot of missing data when it comes to crime, which is definitely one thing I've noticed on, on this Mentimeter. Um, it worries me that something technical would go wrong. When you say something technical, I suspect you mean in terms of your own coding and analysis. And I would like to say that that's absolutely fine. I believe that coding is, it's about trial and error. It's about getting things wrong and understanding then how to correct these mistakes. And I think that's the best way to learn, especially with program languages. Um, I've made mistakes on live code demonstrations. I've made mistakes in, in, in coding before and it happens. That's the only way you can really learn from your mistakes. Do not worry about getting errors and warning messages because they're all, they can all be resolved. Um, but yes, thanks all for participating in that. I see that we have a question in the Q&A. Uh, so let me just answer that one first. The question states, is cylindrical projection the most common form of projection when it comes to say, weather data? Uh, yes, I would say that the Mercator projection, which is under the cylindrical family, uh, this, this type of projection minimizes the distortion near the equator, which makes it better for tracking weather systems at low altitudes, at a latitude, sorry. So the closer you are to the equator on a Mercator projection, the more um, accurate the distance representation is. So I hope it answers that. Um, the cylindrical would be best for weather data. And if I had to give an example, I'd probably say the Mercator projection. Um, so yeah, that's kind of rounded off this webinar. There are no more questions in the Q&A, but feel free to keep answering. I'll be around till half past. But in the meantime, I'll just explain to you the material for Wednesday. Most, uh, sorry, all the material can be found on the GitHub link, which I think Emma will post into the chat again for you. Everything will be under the March 2023 folder. Now, if you've never used GitHub before, then have no fear. They will demonstrate how to obtain the data uh, 
at the start of the code demonstration. But to kind of summarize, there are three ways you could get the data. One is to simply clone the repository into your own complete computer. The second would just to be download the uh, folder that's on GitHub onto your own computer. And the third way is to use the interactive binder links that are available. This third option is um, probably the best one in terms of people who do not have R Studio or Git installed yet. It means that you can run the code demonstration on your browser without having to install any access, any extra um, software. It obviously means that this will run a bit slower. And if you're trying to follow along during the code demonstration, um, it might be a little bit slower, but that the binders will be available um, indefinitely on the GitHub. So you can always do this in your own time. I've got a list of references that were used for this slide. Uh, slide decks will be posted, I believe, at the end of the second talk. Um, and I'll also add these to the GitHub account. Yes, yeah, thank you for completing all of the polls and the surveys. And a huge thank you to Emma and Jill for facilitating this webinar. And um, yes, so thank you all. I'll hang around for five minutes for any questions. And if not, thanks all for attending.